It's one of the world's most popular fish. It's also one of the most controversial. Catfish from Asia has been proven to contain cancer-causing chemicals. Its critics say it's mass-produced in dirty conditions, endangering consumers' health. Every year, 220,000 tons of industrial waste are dumped into the Mekong River Delta. Seafood producers deny the river poses a health problem. There's nothing wrong with the Mekong Delta River. It got tested every week. Foreign competitors have campaigned to have it banned. We import millions and millions of fish fillets caught in this slop. And it's also an ideal fish for food fraudsters who can pass it off as far more expensive species. If you add the amount of money that's made in narcotics trade and people smuggling, put it together, it doesn't even come close to the amount of fraud that's going on and money that's made in our food system. So what's the real story about that fish on your plate? The Mekong Delta stretches over 40,000 square kilometers of southern Vietnam. We are very near the farm, so just take uh, five minutes from here. This is the, the Mekong River, and you can see that the color is very clear, very clear, very green. The river is a vital resource for the Vietnamese people and its fish farmers. Home to Vietnam's massive aquaculture business, worth 2 billion US dollars a year in exports. The world is eating more fish now than ever. But wild caught seafood can't satisfy this booming demand for cheap protein. Aquaculture or farmed fish can. Europe, the US especially, Developed countries saw the Pangasius as a alternative white fish to, say, pollock or cod. So it was another alternative for them to, to develop. That led to, uh, uh, you know, to demand. The warm waters of the Mekong Delta are ideal for farming Pangasius, a fast-growing white fish and an ideal replacement for overfished ocean seafood. But it's a great success story that's muddied by controversy and confusion. In Singapore, they call it dory. In Europe, they call it bassa or Vietnamese cobbler. In America, it's called catfish. And in Vietnam, its proper name is pangasius. It's all the same fish, but called by different names in different markets. Pangasius, in terms of the export, probably one of the most important resource in Vietnam. At the moment, they export about more than 70 to 80 percent of the volume of pangasius for the whole world. It's one of the most successful fish on the block. It's cheap to produce, ideally suited to fish farming or aquaculture. Most people don't realize now that more than 50 percent of all the fish that we eat now in the world has come from aquaculture and it is giving a livelihood to many, many millions of people across the world. And that's what the people of Vietnam needed following liberalization of their economy in the 90s. Commercial large-scale farming providing commodities they could export at industrial levels. It was in the 1990s that uh, a bunch of French scientists came into Vietnam and developed the spawning technology, uh, and that was the start of the Pangasius boom. What I want to talk to you about tonight is seafood. This university. Is... Professor Simon Bush is one of the world's leading experts on the global production of sustainable seafood. He's also studied the growth of Pangasius production in Vietnam. 
From that moment, you started to see a lot of cage culture of Pangasius along the rivers in Vietnam. And as a result of that, they started to look not only for markets within Vietnam, but also abroad. Gojiko Seafood was established by John Yuen's father 30 years ago. It's now one of the leading exporters of Pangasius products in Vietnam. It's only in Vietnam that we can produce the best quality of Pangasius product. The government tried to protect the Pangasius industry because it brings revenue to them, the export revenue to them. This product is going to Switzerland, and this is a very big customer for us. This product sells at a very high price, so it's a good profit margin. The initial success of Vietnamese Pangasia sales overseas soon attracted attention from other fish producers and trouble. Pangasius producers were hit with a deluge of criticism, rubbishing its reputation. In the United States, 90% of seafood consumed is imported. But in Europe, it's 65% of the fish we eat is imported. They've become less and less competitive when it comes to a globally traded seafood market. So these countries have a very strong, let's say, uh, they, they have a very strong opinion about the incoming seafood. Over the past two years, millions of pounds of seafood from China and Vietnam were refused entry into the United States because independent tests found the fish contained banned drugs and chemicals, including known carcinogens. There were damning media reports that the fish is farmed in filthy conditions and isn't fit to eat. There's been so much said about the Pangasius industry over the last decade and so much misinformation which has been put into the public. It's very difficult to distinguish, you know, fiction from facts. Pangasius is sold as catfish in America. US catfish producers, alarmed by the sudden threat of competition, lobbied the American government to ban the import of Pangasius. They also encouraged American and foreign media scrutiny of the alleged health risks of the fish. When you buy imported catfish, you may be getting more than you bargained for. Catfish from Asia has been proven to contain cancer-causing chemicals, unapproved drugs, industrial waste. U.S. farm-raised catfish, on the other hand, is inspected by the USDA for food safety. We see a number of uh, claims made against Pangasius that it's unsafe to eat, that it's associated with poor working conditions, uh, and in general that the Mekong River is, uh, is a poor environment. The quality of the water in the Mekong Delta, where the Pangasius is farmed, was the first target for the anti-Pangasius campaigners. First thing they often do, they look down at the river and see brown water, especially in the rainy season. And brown water to them was dirty water. And uh, that's not a very scientific way to assess how clean a river is, but uh, you know, it is a muddy river. The president of the Catfish Institute in America called the Mekong the toilet bowl of Asia. And a spokesman claimed that in many cases, fish are essentially raised in cesspools. But defenders of Vietnamese Pangasius say there is no good evidence that the delta is dangerously contaminated or that fish raised in these waters is unsafe to eat. It has a lot of organic content. Are there pollutants in the river? No doubt. But it's a very important thing to realise that there's a difference between a pollutant being in the river as a hazard, but also the difference between that and actually understanding the risk that it poses. You have to have very clear amounts of any pollutant for it to pose a risk uh, to human health, but also to the environment. This is Chow Doc, a small town in the north of Vietnam. It's where many of the critical foreign media reports were filmed. Every year, 220,000 tonnes of industrial waste are dumped into the Mekong River Delta. Sewage from these houses goes directly into the water. 
Children play in the water. People wash their clothes, their dishes, and themselves in the same water where they raise ducks and throw trash. The foreign reports allege that Pangasius was unsafe to eat because it was produced in heavily polluted waters. But were these reports fair and accurate? When I hear that claims are made that the Mekong River is one of the most polluted in the world, I haven't seen evidence for that. Professor Lian Tuan is a senior lecturer at the University of Kanto and has studied the water quality of the Mekong since the start of his career. The professor says focusing simply on the appearance of the water is misleading when it comes to judging if fish farmed here is safe to eat. Bởi cái màu màu đục này chính là cái dinh dưỡng cho cho nông nghiệp và thủy sản nên cái khái niệm sạch á mình phải định nghĩa là sạch theo nghĩa nào sạch cho sức khỏe hay là sạch cho cây trồng hay sạch cho thủy sản thì có thể nó nó sẽ khác nhau. Còn con sạch thủy sản người ta cũng có thể nuôi trồng thủy sản được. In fact, experts say that clear-looking water may mean it lacks the nutrients fish need to grow. À, tôi có yên tâm về điều này nhưng mà vì sự tất cả mà nuôi trong trong ao thì nước trong ao thì nó là lại bẩn. À, nhưng mà nước ngoài này thì còn sạch. À, cái đó là Phomosa ở phía bắc chứ không phải là ở đồng bằng sông Cửu Long. À, nó đi từ ở Hà Tĩnh cho tới à, rồi đi chơi tới từ Thiên Huế. Nhưng mà cái đó là vùng ngoài vùng đồng bằng sông Cửu Long và nó thải là thải ra biển thì vùng ven biển trên cái vùng này. We have to understand that there are rigorous testing regimes over the fish. And if we're talking about a food safety issue, uh, the systems are in place to pick those pollutants up. So can we trust those systems to safeguard our health? Tung has worked for Vinhone, the biggest single producer of Pangasius in the world, for the last seven years. We need to sterilize the, our shoes. This is like the hygiene procedure to prevent the disease from the other farms into our farm. Just one kind of bacteria can cause the, the, the disease for Pangasius. The farm here has 12 large ponds each raising up to half a million fish in every production cycle. Tung says they monitor the water constantly to ensure that the fish produced in these waters is safe to eat. Every time we train the water, we will test the water quality in the Mekong River before we pump the water into the pond. The tests, she says, are for consistency and quality in the fish. We will take some parameter like oxygen level, pH, temperature, and then we also take the sample and send to the lab to test regularly the pesticide residue and healthy metal. Sometimes, low temperatures or unusual cloudiness in the rainy season means they'll delay changing the water in the ponds. They do add chemicals to the water as some critics accuse them of, but they say they're not harmful. Chemical, but very natural, like probiotics, prebiotics. You, you chase the, the water, then we pump the water from the river into the pond. 
and then we will use lamb to chest the water. These enclosed ponds are also better for the environment than open cages in the river. Katrin Zuko is entsetzt. In 2010, the World Wildlife Fund, a global authority on the environment, put Vietnamese Pangasius on their don't buy list and seemingly supported a damning German documentary about farming conditions. But following strong protests from the Vietnamese, WWF conceded that they had used outdated and incomplete information. The documentary was not supported by WWF International, who decided it was better to work together with the Vietnamese Pangasius industry to certify their practices and raise them to global standards. We find the farmers to be eager to hear what we have to say, eager to work together to achieve our shared goals that is a long-term sustainable future for the industry that truly is in harmony with nature. It was after actually visiting the Pangasius farms on the Delta at the invitation of the Vietnamese government that the WWF reversed their position. At the moment, there's nothing wrong with the Mekong Delta River because it got tested every, every week, every monthly, weekly, yearly. If it's, there's a problem with Mekong Delta River, they, we wouldn't be growing the fish in this kind of place, you know, the water quality. The Vietnamese Pangasius that most people eat is mass-produced and prepared for export in modern factories like this one owned by John's family. There's different opinion, but I don't, a lot of people, my, especially my customer, really like the taste of Pangasius. John Yuan is confident that the industry can survive all criticisms. If, if it's really like everybody thinks it's, it's a bad fish, it's, it's not a good quality fish, then you will see the slump in the, in the demand right now. But you can see the quite opposite. It's really going up right now. Demand is go up and the price go up. The damning American media reports resulted in Vietnamese Pangasius being banned in three US states. U.S. catfish farmers were very threatened by the rise of this and Vietnamese catfish. They kind of looked at this and said, okay, it's, it's a cheaper than us and our costs are this and we apply to this standard and must be cheaper and therefore the processes must be bad. And, you know, I think there was some element of, yeah, protectionism and, and trying to find a reason why, uh, you know, if it, if it can compete and it's low cost, it must be made in a bad way. But the cost of production is just much cheaper in Vietnam. Producers say they have survived the campaigns of vilification by targeting markets closer to home. Without US market, we, we're still doing well, right? We have China market, we have, um, you know, other Asian market, we have Middle East market. Uh, we have basically, beside US, we have the rest of the market in the world. Okay. And uh, that's, yeah, we, we, we're not too worried about that. But the Pangasius is not in the clear yet. The questions and allegations keep coming. There is a massive risk to us all in the future in terms of the big issue of antimicrobial resistance. Professor Chris Elliott runs the Global Institute of Food Security in the UK and is a leader in tackling the multinational challenges of food safety. I haven't found reports of people dying or getting ill from eating Pangasius. But the real issue are what are the long-term effects of eating food products, not only fish, but other things that are pumped full of antibiotics. The industry maintains that international standards are followed in the fish they export, both in the fish feed and any use of antibiotics. Lee Van Tung works for a contract farmer supplying Vin Hoan, Vietnam's largest Pangasius producer, amongst other companies. He says he has to follow strict guidelines.
He's keen to show us that his fish food is free of harmful ingredients. Thành phần của thức ăn gen fish này gồm có bột cá, bột mực, tấm gạo, bột mì, cám gạo, khô dầu, đậu nành, các loại axit, amin, khoáng, vitamin, dược liệu không có. Tức là không được sử dụng nguyên liệu có nguồn gốc từ cá cha và cá ba sa. Really, it's not that easy to put antibiotic, to put more chemical inside the fish and sell it. Everything is approved by the government agency. So it's not like we do it just for us. Nonetheless, antibiotic resistance is a growing and very real threat. While big producers say their use of antibiotics is tightly regulated and safe, some of the world's leading experts on food safety are far from convinced. We do have this massive issue of antimicrobial resistance. And what that really means to all of us is the antibiotics that we get prescribed for, the, for our health, for our family's health, are becoming less and less effective. And the reason for that, overuse of antibiotics. Yet we have some of these very intensive industries, particularly aquaculture, that relies very heavily on the use of such antibiotics. It's something that really has to be stamped out. It's not just the use of antibiotics that are alleged to be harmful in the production of Pangasius in Vietnam. There are further disturbing claims, mostly circulated on the internet, that hormones from the urine of pregnant women are injected into the Pangasius. For the breeding, is misleading uh, information uh, because a chemical extracted is in the laboratory. V. Tam, the CEO of Vin Hone, says that while hormones are used in the breeding process, they're manufactured in a laboratory. It's a chemically produced hormone, not a natural one, which may not be that reassuring for many consumers. The hormone allows eggs to be extracted manually from the fish out of water and fertilized. For some, the thought of eating fish produced using these techniques is pretty revolting. But is it actually harmful to our health? I think consumers do have a right to know about what the hazards are associated with any food that they're consuming, but they also should understand that there's a difference between a hazard and a risk. And we can see that there are a lot of hazards out there, not only in Pangasius, but in any food item that we may consume. Uh, but we have to consume an awful lot of those foods in order for it to become a risk uh, to our health. It's been a decade since the first negative reports surfaced from the US, and the stories have been kept alive on the internet and social media. Todavía queda mucho por investigar ahí abajo. Viajamos al país del panga, Vietnam. Sabían por In 2016, yet another damning documentary about Vietnamese pangasius was made. This time from Spanish TV. After this Spanish TV report aired, the relentless stream of claims against Pangasius prompted large supermarkets like Carrefour in Europe to simply take it off their shelves. Depuis quelques années, il a mauvaise réputation. Pourquoi son prix est-il si bas? Dans quelles conditions est-il élevé? Quels sont les secrets d'un poisson devenu le favori des industriels et des cantines scolaires? This French documentary, also from 2016, is more measured, posing the question why the Vietnamese Pangasius is so much cheaper than other white fish. The answer is clear, say the producers. The price is low because Pangasius can be stocked at very high densities, has a short breeding cycle and a low mortality rate. Bien que dans cet étang, il y a plus de 600 000 panga en élevage intensif, des poissons plutôt voraces, puisqu'ils mangent 400 sacs comme celui-ci tous les jours. But the French film goes on to make the same allegations as before. The Mekong River is highly polluted, the fish is raised in dirty conditions, and drugs are used to control diseases and to promote rapid growth. It's a relentless barrage that's taking its toll. There's been an accumulation of these claims over a number of years, and I, I simply think some of the retailers in Europe have have said we're tired of having to uh, deal with and respond to some of these claims. By focusing primarily on small-scale producers and their crude methods, big exporters say the foreign media reports ignore the care taken by them to produce fish cleanly. They just paint a very damaging picture of the whole Vietnamese industry.
when the news channel came here and did all the bad stuff, film all the bad information. We didn't know back then, we didn't know that they, they did it like really silently. So were the foreign reports unfair? Chow Dok has often been the focus of the foreign documentaries and news reports about the Pangasius industry in Vietnam. It lies at what was the heart of small-scale Pangasius farming, using old-style traditional methods very different from the large modern producers like Vinh Home or Godeco. Their rudimentary farming practices made for embarrassing footage and caused the whole industry to be tarred with the same brush. Tình hình xuất khẩu không tốt, rồi hậu dân người ta nó không có theo xuất khẩu nữa, người ta phải nuôi cá nội địa không là nhiều. Thành ra cái chợ làng bè này cũng rất ít những người còn nuôi cá ba sa. Tôi chuyển hình thức lên nuôi hầm hết. Pava Quang has given up farming Pangasius and now runs a wholesale business dealing in household goods. The only thriving fish business here is the farming of a different fish, the lang na which sells for 10 times the price of Pangasius. But the Langnya can't be farmed cheaply and intensively on the same scale as Pangasius. And as a delicacy which commands high prices locally, it isn't exported. So it hasn't come under the same scrutiny. Ah, nuôi cũng bốn năm nay rồi. Ah, cái loại cá mới đúng không? Mới cái này nuôi địa không ai chịu không có xuất khẩu. Ah, vâng. Tava Quang took us to one small-scale farmer still raising Pangasius. Thì mình nuôi cỡ mười tháng rồi mấy tháng rồi bác. Nhưng nó mẹ nó giáp năm đi. Dong Chen Dong makes a special mix of food for his fish. He uses the glue powder to bind his homemade fish food into pellets, not an ingredient found in commercial food. And feeding fish to fish is often criticized as potentially harmful, as is the use of antibiotics to treat disease. But Duong says he rarely treats his fish with antibiotics. Thức ăn người ta gần thì nào gần bán người ta mua thức ăn bao bao là bao thứ này nè. He does give them medication for lice and other problems, but when we asked to see what drugs he gave them, he wasn't able to help. Many critical media reports have focused on these small-scale farmers and their crude methods of production, without mentioning that small-scale farmers just do not export their fish anymore. Giờ nuôi chỉ bán chợ này nè. Chứ cá he đó, cá he năm rồi thì bán cũng được xuất khẩu. Now in fairness, you can go anywhere up and down the Mekong and find fish or shrimp or anything made in a backyard sort of way with people smoking and skin diving in the cages and pulling. You can still find that today, but none of that is exported. In the last decade, the structure and production techniques of the Pangasius industry have changed dramatically. Small-scale farmers with old-style production methods have been pushed out of the market. In the old days, we saw a large number of small producers throughout the Mekong Delta. But what we've seen over the last 10 years is a huge concentration of farms. So a lot of processors now own farms or buy from a very small number of farms, but these farms are large and they're industrial. And as a result, the level of control over production from both an environmental certification perspective, but also from a food safety certification perspective, has increased dramatically. Food safety today 
is at the forefront of many consumers' minds and why campaigns against competitors can be very effective. But there's a new and frightening practice involving Pangasius that many of us know nothing about. Food fraud, as we describe it, can impact many people in many different ways. It can kill you. It can make you ill. It can make members of your family ill. It will certainly cheat you. It can be mislabeling or misrepresenting food, tampering with it, or substituting an entirely different product. And it's a growing problem. It will cause a great sense of disgust. Sometimes you're eating things, you think, this is not right. It's not ethically right, it's not morally right, it's breaking my religious principles. So it can impact us in so many different ways. Uh, what I'm going to do is test them to see if I can distinguish between these two varieties of rice. I'm using a little handheld near-infrared spectrometer. Professor Chris Elliott runs the Global Institute of Food Safety and has been an expert witness in criminal trials on food safety. You can see now from this, uh, it's doing its model evaluation. There are many, many different ways that you can cheat in a food system. You can add chemicals and dyes that make it look more wholesome and of better value. And then there's the other type of cheating, which is about counterfeiting. So actually what you're buying isn't genuine. Nothing's genuine, not even the packaging. Food fraud. The substitution or adulteration of food is the ideal get-rich-quick scheme for criminals around the world. Well, the calculations currently would say that if you add the amount of money that's made in narcotics trade and people smuggling, put it together, it doesn't even come close to the amount of fraud that's going on and money that's made in our food system. In London on Saturday, the British government held an emergency meeting to discuss the horsemeat crisis. In 2013, Professor Elliott led the British government's inquiry into the horsemeat scandal, when European consumers were appalled to learn that beef and pork they'd been sold was actually horse meat. The reason for that was a massive differential in price between beef and horse meat. Even more worrying is a lot of that horse meat was deemed not fit for human consumption, yet that was making its way into the food supply system right across Europe. Professor Elliott and his colleagues now fight a daily battle against dirty producers and criminal fraudsters who try to trick us into buying food that isn't what it appears to be. The fish that you eat, often you don't know what type of fish it is, you certainly don't know where it's come from. And fish, like Pangasius, are ideal for food fraudsters. It's incredibly hard to tell the difference between identical-looking white fish fillets. There could be health risks, depending on what um, uh, species is being sold, missold, uh, but in most of the cases, it's actually driven by uh, cost. So it's more like a matter of uh, switching a cheaper product for a more expensive product and then overcharging the consumer. Even though Pangasius is commonly sold as dory in parts of Asia, it's not related to the much more expensive, high-quality fish called John Dory, which is a saltwater fish found in coastal areas. Most of us have little or no idea of what we're getting when we buy fish like this. Even staff in fish restaurants seem to be confused about what they're selling. It's the normal freshwater fish. Dory fish actually is a fillet, fish fillet. Oh, it's deep sea. Deep sea, yeah. This is like the We take off the skin. Pangasius has been, and, and as far as we can see, is more and more being implicated in food fraud. Low-cost fish substituting for very high-value fish. Around the world, tests have proved that up to 20% of fish is mislabeled and missold as being of a different and higher quality. The advent of new micro-testing technology should lead to a crackdown on the fish fraudsters. We'll get the DNA sequences and then it will be able to tell you what kind of species it is because um, different animals will have unique DNA sequences. We set up an experiment to find out how much fake fish is really out there. Whenever we buy food from shops, supermarkets and restaurants, 
we ultimately have to place our trust in the food suppliers and hope that they're actually giving us what we've paid for. But sometimes that trust is misplaced. Mislabeling of food items is a serious problem and it's showing up in, in many countries. Rudolf Meyer runs the Evolutionary Biology Laboratory at the National University of Singapore. So it has been done in Europe, has been done in some Asian countries, and usually what is found that in terms of seafood, somewhere between 5 to 20 percent of the samples that are being tested are mislabeled. Remarkably, there's never been any testing of the level of seafood fraud in Singapore, until now. Working with Rudolf and his team, we set up an experiment to find out. We bought 100 samples of seafood and sushi from randomly selected supermarkets and shops across Singapore and took them to the university for analysis. We have taken portions of them and frozen them so it's easier for us to work with. Um, and we have all the information as to what the sample is um, written on here. So this is what I'll be using to then take subsamples to extract the DNA from. Are fish like Pangasius being passed off as identical looking but much more expensive fillets? So before we start processing them, what I need to do is note down which sample is going to which tube for the extraction. Because after this you're not going to be even you're not going to be able to see the tissue pieces. You're working with very minuscule amounts of flesh. It's to determine whether these fish are what the shops claim them to be. World seafood sales hit a record high in 2017. We're all buying and eating more fish in the quest for healthy living. But as we buy more, there's more opportunity for fraudsters to scam us. It's defrauding the consumer. I mean, it goes all the way to, like, uh, taking skates, and taking a hole puncher and punching holes into skates and then selling them as scallops, which of course is, skate is cheap, scallop is expensive. But many consumers are still unaware of the potential fraud. 20% of all fish that you buy is mislabeled. It's not the fish that you're actually buying. Do you have any proof? Where is your proof? I still believe that it won't be happening in Singapore. Singapore does have very strict checks on food safety and is at the forefront of regulation to combat food fraud. But worldwide, few countries can claim to be free of the scam. We're putting the food you eat to the test. We've been using uh, genetic testing for uh, identifying how many uh, seafood products are mislabeled in Singapore. So for this, what we did was called DNA barcoding. Uh, this is essentially amplifying one genetic marker uh, for obtaining uh, some sort of a species identification from any kind of a seafood product. We are now trying to assess how many seafood products are mislabeled. And even global experts admit they can be fooled. It can be difficult for all of us to understand how we can be cheated. We, we, we think we know what we're doing. So I'm quite sure I've been duped as many times as other people have. And that happens more and more frequently as the fish has already been filleted or frozen. It becomes more and more difficult to identify the fish itself. That's the most common fraud. And that's the problem with fish like Pangasius. They're very rarely sold as whole fish. So we've been looking at uh, supermarket products, a lot of uh, fillets, as well as some sushi-related uh, uh, products. We're looking at interested in free seafood mislabeling, right? So we would be more interested in, in a way, looking at processed or slightly, uh, not the entire fish where chances of mislabeling are not that high. Once you've chopped the fish into fillets, it's lost its identity. The more specific a particular texture is or a taste is, the harder it is to fake it. Um, so when it comes to like a generic white fish, I think it's very likely to get uh, replaced quite regularly or being used as replacement fish quite regularly. Uh, but the extent to which it is being used, I don't think is known. Out and about on the streets of Singapore, people had rarely heard of fish fraud, but were shocked when we told them. I don't know, I feel cheated. I think it means representing the fish because it's not the fish. 
I think it's staggering when you actually discover what's actually going into um, the food you're eating. As food fraud grows, institutions around the world are using new technologies to fight it. Chris Elliott and his team at the Institute of Global Safety in the UK are at the forefront of the battle. We all have a unique fingerprint. Law enforcement agencies will use those fingerprints to find perpetrators of crime and lock them up. We are applying exactly the same type of technology to our food detective work because actually each type of food also has its own fingerprint. So, like any other food stuff, fish have an individual digital fingerprint that can be identified using this technique. So as I cut into the fish sample, there's a smoke which is produced. That smoke gets transferred into the mass spectrometer instantaneously. And based on the model that we've created, that sample will be given identification. It's difficult to tell one white fish fillet from another but globally, a database of fish fingerprints is being developed, enabling researchers to identify them immediately. Professor Elliott and his team have yet to establish the distinct digital fingerprint for Pangasius, but when it's tested in their labs, they can instantly tell which fillet is cod and which is the outlier, or odd one out, the Pangasius. Within a few seconds, using our nice fingerprinting technique, it will tell you is what species of fish is it, it will also tell you lots of other information. Has somebody tried to add some chemicals to it? Has somebody tried to bulk it out with water? Our fingerprinting will tell that. These new technologies will become more and more effective as the databases become more comprehensive, allowing different fish to be identified. But in the meantime, fish fraud can only become more lucrative as the market grows. The rate of mislabeling based on this experiment is about 5 to 10%. Out of the 100 samples we provided, the scientists were able to gather 77 testable sequences of DNA. Seven of these were found to be fraudulent. We found Kaplan roe sold as prawn roe, flounder being sold as halibut, Indian halibut being sold as sole, Pacific salmon being sold as Atlantic salmon, and Pangasius being sold as toman, or giant snakehead, a much more expensive fish. Pangasius has been known to replace other uh, seafood products in the market. The product was called giant snake or toaman, but it was actually genetically tested to be a Pangasius. Well, they are considerably different. This is a clear case of mislabeling of the product. In a subsequent test, the toman showed a mixed reading, but it's inconclusive and the sample could have been contaminated after the first test. The process isn't foolproof yet. But that's why fish fraud happens and is hard to detect. Substituting a cheap fish like Pangasius for the snakehead or toman, an expensive delicacy. Based on our experiment, it seems that as many as one in 10 of the fish sold in Singapore may not be what they think it is. It's not about whether it's eatable or not. It's uh, cheating, right? It's, uh, it's wrong to like, lie to people. In the current business world, I, it's not a surprise to me because people is chasing money. Is this something we should be concerned about? I'm afraid the answer is yes. Because it's going on, it's happening. If you buy food and the price is too good to be true, don't buy it. The seafood supply chain is incredibly long and complicated. So it's often difficult to determine where the mislabeling occurred. Is it at the supplier, distributor, or retailer? Pangasius producers like John recognize the problem, but say there's little they can do. You know, they use uh, the name of more expensive fish to sell a cheaper quality fish. What, what, what they call outside is what different inside. Once you sell the product to customer, it's their, it's their possession, right? They can do whatever they want. Once it's left the factory in Vietnam, the producers say they're powerless to prevent consumer fraud. You cannot tell them, oh, you must sell this to this customer, you must sell this to this uh, channel, you must make it this. You cannot do that, right? Yet your responsibility is to, to sell a customer, customer pay you, and it's that the customer decision choice to do whatever they want with the, the fish. So it's really, it's, we, we are, 
In this scenario, we are kind of powerless. You've got to ask yourself, where is that renaming coming from? It's certainly not coming from the Vietnamese selling it as Seoul. It's coming from re vendors uh, in the final consumer markets, which are relabeling that fish. Despite all the controversies, the truth is we need fish like Pangasius. It's just the kind of cheap and nutritious protein essential to feed an ever-growing and ever more hungry world. Pangasius is an Asian aquaculture success story and I think the rest of the world has to give it a bit more credit for being such an important source of fish uh, at produced at such high levels of efficiency. Does that mean that there are no problems with the industry? Absolutely not. Like any food production system there are going to be concerns but the point is that we have the institutions in place that are able to pick up and to deal with those issues as they come. And Vietnamese producers are confident they have enough customers to stay in the market, whatever happens. We're still here. It's kind of at that moment, people, it be, some, some people that doesn't, like some people that don't know about mangasus, that will feel that, oh, okay, I would not eat this. But if people, for people who are already eating it, they know how good the product uh, are, and they will say, you know, there's nothing wrong with the product. We still keep buying and, yep. So we have loyal customer. We have loyal market. In the end, it really all comes down to consumer knowledge and consumer choice.